Okay, so as what I'm showing you is basically a somewhat uneventful uh, Bay Area, Northern California, coastal, uh, coast live oak, Bay Laurel habitat uh, with uh, sp uh, poison oak just sprinkled everywhere. Real bad ass rash. Uh, anyway, I'm only showing you this. See, this is kind of uneventful. It's nice habitat, but there's not, not much here that really gets me gone. Okay, but I'm just showing you this so you can contrast it with what I'm about to show you. Uh, just a couple hundred yards up the hill where the uh, soil situation and uh, the parent material that creates the change. So anyway, now I just up here you could see uh, San Francisco Bay off in the distance. And this whole uh, substrate is basically uh, a thick soil layer with a bunch of invasive grasses and bullshit on it. And then of course Oak Bay Woodland over there. But uh, the bedrock here is all old uh, marine sediments. It's basically shale and sandstone that was once uh, the floor of a shallow sea and then of course was uplifted by compressional forces uh, both before and after the creation of San Andreas Fault. You know, so you got your soil up there which is basically just, you know, the organic materials and the clays and shit. And uh, then beneath, you know, it's, it's just created by year after year of plants growing and dying over, over thousands of years. And then of course, you know, you got a whole bunch of other biological activities going on down in the soil. But once you get below the soil, you get to the bedrock layer, that's when you get to the real interesting stuff, which is the, the silicious, that is silica-based shale and sandstone, which uh, we're going to see down there, which, of course, is the focus uh, of the next plant that I was about to show you. And it's the only reason that they're there. They can't grow on this shit because they'll rot, okay? They'll rot. They need the bare exposures of the silicious shale. So already you're seeing a changeover from the invasive bullshit to the bacteria, which is native. Uh, and the only reason I can think of that it just stops like that is, of course, there's something going on with the soil, uh, and the invasives just can't compete. Uh, look at this nice landslide over there. So anyway, we're the keeping keep going down, and we're gonna end up somewhere real nice. And you'll see it's just a drastic change up from all the invasive bullshit, and even from the uh, oak woodland. Okay, so a little bit lower. See, you can see obviously what we're going for. It's a species of Arctostaphylos that only grows in two locations in the world. Uh, it's, we're starting to hit the bedrock. The basically pure exposures of limestone and silicious shale where it grows, but we gotta keep going. Nice Claytonia perfoliata, that's a native. In the Montiaceae, which is in the Karyophyllales, in order of, uh, it's in order, with the same order as cacti and beets, but uh, obviously quite different in form. Miner's lettuce is the name of that. So anyway, you can see, we're getting a little bit of change up here in the substrate and in the flora. And uh, there you go. It just opens up. Uh, it changes from it's from this thick uh, oak woodland to uh, basically a mini elfin forest of Arctostaphylos. That's the main thing needed. And you got two species here. This with the burl. See the burl? This is the burl. That's Arctostaphylos crustacea. And then further down with the sessile leaves that don't have a petiole is the Arctostaphylos pallida, which again only grows in two locations in the world. Here in beautiful El Sobrante, California, I say that very facetiously, and uh, uh, the Oakland Hills. So so real quick, another thing I want to point out, if you remember one of the diagnostic factors of figuring out what species of uh, Arctostaphylos you're looking at is the presence of a burl or not, okay? And this is basically a burl. It's basically a big enlarged woody root system that, that often has multiple trunks and a lot of the Arctostaphylos do it, the, uh, uh, I believe the Camarostaphylos do it, uh, the Ornithostaphylos, that rare Ericaceae from Baja does it, uh, as well as the Xylococcus, which is uh, the mission manzanita, not a true manzanita, but in the uh, Arbutoid Ericaceae. Again, these all form symbiotic relationships with fungi in the ground, and they possess the ability to re-sprout in the event of a fire, which they're adapted to. Now, the ones that don't have a burl re-sprout uh, just from soil seed bank. If you dig in this duff, it goes down five, six inches, and it's all uh, seeds and leaf tissue decomposing. Those seeds will stay in that soil for, you know, a couple decades until a fire comes through, and they're actually triggered by chemicals in the smoke. Okay, so this is the spot to take a shit if you're a coyote, apparently. But here you could see there's no soil. It's just basically a huge uh, exposure, for whatever reason, of the bare parent material, the the... the bedrock, which again is this silicious shale. It's basically uh, mud with biogenic silica in it, 
Uh, and the biogenic silica, of course, was created by uh, algae, marine algae, marine plankton, that uh, produce a glass shell. Uh, you know, the silica, silica, just like carbon and oxygen, etc., have has its own cycle. There's a whole cycle of uh, silica on planet Earth. Uh, I couldn't tell you much more about that. You're gonna have to look that up on, for you know for yourself on a Google over there. But uh, you know, basically, these organisms are able to uh, extract silica from their environment, build their little glass shells, radiolarians, and diatoms. You might have heard of diatomaceous earth. And then when they die, and they die by they grow and die by the billions every day. That's when you get the goddamn biogenic silica-based uh, mud, which is what, of course. This is growing on. Now here, this is actually a good explanation here. You got a good way to differentiate between the two species. Here's the Arctostaphylos crustacea, somewhat common. And here's the very rare Arctostaphylos pallida. If you look up close, uh, this does not have a petiole. The leaves are what you call sessile. See how they just attach basically right to the stem right there? But then if you go over here and you look at this one, okay? You know, you could see it's got a stem. See that? It's got a little stem. All right, and then of course, the uh, Arctostaphylos crustacea has the burl, the basal burl. The Arctostaphylos pallida does not, and the Arctostaphylos pallida is also a lot more. It's got a lot more of a blue color. To me, it's almost it's a very beautiful manzanita. And there's the trunk too. Look at that, just fucking massive arbutoid trunk. The madrones get this same thing. Real smooth, nice bark, smooth, nice. All right, you touch it, you can almost feel the water in there. It's cool. You touch this on like an 80 degree day, it's cold because it's just covered in water. Then you got the, the lichens and all the shit around it. You know, just a beautiful goddamn plant. And again, this was much more widespread uh, before human development came. And, uh, you know, all the rich people built the houses in the Oakland Hills and then uh, filled in their yards with a hideous landscaping. Now, if I can get through this without breaking my ace, I think I was going to have to crawl. I think I just got to crawl. Look at this goddamn lichen, too. Look at it. Whole whole different community going on this, this fucking, uh, well, this is a dead pine. It looks like orchard and oak. But then you got the Arctostaphylos pallida over here, too. Uh, and you got some nice cladonias growing. See the lichen? You know, sometimes when you feel like drinking a bottle of copper lime rust or perhaps liquid plumber, you know, you had a hard week or a hard past six years and you want to check out. You just come up here and you look at this old boy. He's been here for goddamn 80 years. It you know, comes you right down. Comes you right the fuck down. But anyway, I want to show you this over here. Okay. The thing I forgot to mention. If I could crawl through this shit without breaking my ace. The thing I forgot to mention is that all the manzanitas are buzz pollinated. Meaning that the bees don't actually go inside the, uh, the urn shaped white flowers. What they do is they, uh, you got the flower hanging down there, and the bee doesn't actually go inside it, but the frequency of the vibration of its wings cause pollen to spill, basically spill out of the uh, the little hole of this uh, fused petaled corolla. Let's see if I can find a, a flower in a... So anyway, as I was saying, you could just see that it's basically just a, a drastic change up uh, from the oak woodland further up the slope there. It's just an entire landscape of... Uh, of, like I said, silicious shale. It's silica-based uh, mudstone from an ancient ocean. Now, this is about 15 million year old. That's Miocene uh, shale. And again, it's, it was once on the ground of a shell, on the floor of a shallow sea, and then it's been uplifted by tectonic forces. And again, this right here now is all Arctostaphylos pallida. There's no Arctostaphylos crustacea which is a much more common one further upslope. This again is the critically endangered one, the very rare sessile and blue-leafed Arctostaphylos pallida, the Oakland Hills uh, manzanita. Nice uh, nice view of the substrate there. You can tell it's a uh, silica. It's got the it's pretty sharp edges to it. You know, but again, it's just mudstone, so it crumbles pretty easy. Hasn't been metamorphosed at all. Hasn't been cooked. Okay, now another thing I want to point out with manzanita, since all the flowers kind of look the same, and they're, uh, unlike most plants, the flowers aren't the key identifying factor uh, for this genus. So you look at the fruits, uh, which are, they can be, you know, basically you look at the fruits and you try to figure out they're glabrous, you know, which is shiny, or sticky, which is glandular. And these are, these are glandular fruits. So, you know, if you're trying to figure out, you saw this in a botanic garden or something, you didn't know what it was, 
that would be a key thing to pay attention to to figure out what the hell species you're looking at. You look at a botanic key and you figure that out, okay? They got the sticky glandular fruits. Now, again, this berry has about five or six seeds in it, and they're kind of uh, stuck together in a ring. They break up once they dehiss. Uh, and rodents, I think one of the main uh, things that distributes the seed on the mains is the rodents, you know? So they'll eat some of them, they'll eat half of them and throw the rest, rest away, leave them in the duff. Or they'll, they'll, you know, cache them in their little uh, rat hole, okay? So what you what you got now is this is the soil seed bank. Remember, you got the burls for some of the mains, and then you get the soil seed bank for the others. And this is the soil seed bank. It's just, you know, layers and layers of duff with all the leaves and shit and the, the you know, different pieces of twig and plant debris. And then, of course, in there, you get the seeds too, okay? And they'll lay in there and wait till they get a fire that goes over and, uh, Again, uh, not sure if it's the heat as well as the chemicals in the smoke, but certainly the chemicals in the smoke will trigger the germination in this plant. I know a guy who just germinated some of these, and what he did is he took the, uh, the liquid smoke, you know, like you'd use on a barbecue. He put it, mixed it with some water. He shook the seeds up in a can with some decomposed granite rocks first, shook them up, scarified them, at the, you know, to basically to scratch that seed coat a little bit. And then he soaked them for 24 hours in Stubbs liquid smoke mixed with water. So speaking of the rates, the rates, which again, uh, help distribute the seed for these delicate bastards, for these beautiful plants, which have such a goddamn, I just put my hand in rabbit shit. There is a goddamn rat nest, okay? A massive wood rat nest. Now these guys, these are the delicate bastards they take the seeds, they eat some of them, they squirrel them away, okay, they're stashing them, okay, they stash them on the soil, and they forget about some of them, and they're the ones responsible for keeping the whole goddamn soil seed bank alive, because this is all going to burn one day, which then makes you wonder why the rich people build their houses on these fucking hills where fires have been intermittently occurring for thousands upon thousands of years. I don't know, it doesn't make much sense to me, but uh, regardless... That's what's going on here. That's the ecosystem. It's a chaparral ecosystem. This you would call maritime chaparral since we're influenced. We got the maritime uh, influence of the marine layer of the uh, ocean just a couple miles to the west. Now, there's a whole bunch of mains that need adversity all up and down the coast of California in this type of habitat. Uh, maritime chaparral. Okay, and again, lastly, I do want to point out that I don't see no oak trees over there except there's one over there. They're 20 feet away, a dainty little coast live oak, not doing so hot, not certainly not doing as well as these manzanitas seem to be doing. But here's an amanita, okay, which you could tell by those. It's got that kind of eggshell thing going on in the stem, and uh, it's got the the cup that it's. Uh, I'm probably fucking this up because I'm not a mycologist, all the terminology. But it's what did you call it? A vulva? I don't know what you call it. But it is an amanita, and they're mycorrhizal. They're symbiotic with plants. Uh, could it be symbiotic? Could it be mycorrhizal with the uh, manzanita? I didn't know manzanita was symbiotic with the uh, ectomycorrhizal uh, uh, amanitas, you know? Or is it really just tapping into that oak tree root way the fuck over there? Who knows? Pretty interesting, though. The, lay, the, the soil layer here has just got to be filled with some really interesting uh, biota, you know? Really cool microbes, important fungi. There's a lot going on here. Okay, so here's a real weird pollination mechanism going on. This is the uh, manzanita flower. All the manzanita flowers look like this. You can't tell, but it's basically a corolla of fused petals in the shape of an urn, okay? And if you get up in there, okay, you got the anthers, which hold the pollen. And uh, I believe, I don't even know where the fucking, st I guess the, st yeah, the stigma's in there too, but it's way up in there. Now, of course, a lot of the bees don't go up in there. What they will do actually is they, uh, see, well, there's a, there's the stigma on that, this guy. See that? The little pink antenna sticking out. Uh, and what the, what the bees will do is the vibration, they'll go up in there and they'll, they'll uh, go in, go just to that entrance and the vibration of their wings will trigger the anthers, which are way up towards the top of that urn to just release a massive amount of pollen. And you can just see it just spill out. And there's actually a video online you can go to and they, you, where there's some lady, she holds a tuning fork up to it. And she just, the tuna fork is the right frequency. I think it's like between 300 and 600 hertz or something like that. She holds it right up there. And you just see this. Once the tuna fork gets close enough to the flower, you see the pollen just spill out of there. 
very interesting uh, pollination strategy going on. Now see these flowers have already been pollinated and the corolla has dehissed and dropped off and that's why you just got the stigma remaining and then of course uh, that stigma eventually drops off too and you're left with uh, a berry which contains a nutlet of, of six, five or six fused seeds. They're fused in a circle.